Good evening and welcome to the June 19th, 2017 Board of Commissioner meeting. At this time, the Reverend Kim Faraby will be kind enough to give us the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance if you could all stand. Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for this time to come together. Father, we thank you for your many blessings. And God, we ask tonight as we assemble together that you would give us wisdom as we seek you for wise counsel. Father, we pray over the agenda that has been made on tonight. And Father, we pray even if we disagree that we will come to a medium of agreement. And God, we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Faraby. You may be seated. At this time, I would look for an approval of the agenda. I do have one amendment. And I would put that at the very end of the meeting after the uh, special meeting of the TDA. Um, that would be a closed session pursuant to GS 143 dash. 318.11A3 to consult with county attorney in order to preserve county client privilege and to receive advice from the county attorney regarding a claim against the county and for the following pending lawsuit, Latendra versus Currituck County. Much to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to public comment. I currently do not have anyone signed up for public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak to public comment this evening? Uh, if you would come up and state your name and address, please. Um, we allow three minutes for public comment. Thank you. Hi, thank you for allowing me to talk. My name is Michael Carter. I'm on 116 Rolling Creek Road here in Moyoc. Um, we just least recently moved here from Chesapeake, Virginia. And you know, one of the reasons we love this area was because of the rural nature of it. Um, however, um, we end up having to do a lot of our shopping in Chesapeake, and you know, I think that the whole mega site, the proposed commercial spaces, um, I think that'll be a good benefit for um, this area because uh, I would definitely want to spend my dollars here and, and support the community. So that's just my comment. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Charter. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Honorable members of the Currituck County Board of Commissioners, my name is Jennifer Knight and I reside on Ballahack Road in Chesapeake. I belong to a community organization with 3,225 members dedicated to stopping excessive development in southern Chesapeake, although I only speak for myself. I believe the Moyoc Mega Site location selection was executed very poorly, and I have questions, lots of questions. Why are you all considering a site that is abutting a state line? Have you all considered the negative impacts this site could potentially bring to the residents of Virginia? Do you all recall the Camden County proposal for the Black Bear landfill and how it ended? When considering level of services, <clears throat> Where are the utilities coming from? Will water and sewer be self-contained within the site? Will you be utilized in Virginia 168 leading to the site? How will this impact the roads paid for by Virginia residents? How will it impact our traffic? If any Virginia resources are utilized, does that make Virginia residents stakeholders? As good neighbors, our relationship should be symbiotic, not parasitic. Did you know we have been working in southern Chesapeake to obtain a dedicated funding source for our OSAP, as well as to establish an agricultural reserve program or transfer of development rights to save our farmland from development? How will an industrial megasite counteract our efforts to preserve agricultural land literally hundreds of feet away? I noticed in an article from the Daily Advance that stormwater on the megasite is a concern for Moyoc residents. Due to the proximity of the site, it is a concern for Virginia residents as well. We all need that land for flood abatement. What protections are available to residents in one state who are impacted by flooding from another state? Would that be a federal issue? I'm not sure, but I have been in contact with Chesapeake City Council and Senator Tim Kaine's Virginia Beach office to make them aware of the situation. Has a wetlands delineation by the Army Corps of Engineers been completed? If not, how do you plan to mitigate, mitigate the negative environmental impacts? 
Has either a phase two historical or archaeological survey been completed? The Virginia-North Carolina state line and adjacent cemetery clearly represent invaluable historic resources that cannot be replaced by industrial developments, apartments, grocery stores, and fast food restaurants. Conjecture on my part, but it appears that a group of landowners has colluded, reached out to planners, and promulgated this idea as a done deal. Landowners have every right to transact land, but it is the responsibility of the local government to include all stakeholders and citizens in the zoning process. Clearly, Virginia residents heretofore have not been a consideration, and quite frankly, wouldn't a more central location better serve the best interests of all of Currituck County? In closing, I'm asking you to reconsider the location of the proposed site and to do the neighborly thing. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you, Ms. Knight. Anyone else would like to speak with public comments? And with that, I'll close the public comment section. Moving on, public hearing, PB 17-05, consideration of the Mellyock Megasite Master Plan. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Cicero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to give you a little bit of project background, um, this uh, master plan for the Moyuk Mega Site came out of the uh, Moyuk Small Area Plan with an area uh, designated as an employment center. And uh, staff has been working with uh, the consultant firm Kimley Horn over the last 18 months to two years to delve a little bit deeper into uh, an, a um, uh, market study as well as this master plan. So I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Carol Collins from Kimley Horn to give us um, his the presentation about this site. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Carol Collins. I'm with Kimley Horn and Associates, uh, 11815 Fountain Way, Suite 300 in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, and as Lori indicated, working from sort of the inception of working with the county from the market feasibility study uh, and now into the, the Moyuk Megasite Master Plan. Uh, is the, there we go. Um, so this evening, most of y'all have seen some of this before. You know, sort of a sort of an eye, a little background on the project itself, uh, as far as it relates to the Moyoc Mega Site Market Feasibility Study uh, that we completed and presented on in March of, of uh, 2016. So market feasibility next steps, and one of those next steps got into the master planning exercise to start to understand uh, what those the results of the market feasibility meant, how that land use or land uses might lay out uh, as it relates to the mega site proper, um, and then some next steps from there. Uh, and then as it relates to the master plan in and of itself, some key elements of the plan, the approach and program development for the for the master plan. What the, what the master plan looks like visually uh, is from large scale and then dialing down to a couple of what we call enlarged area plans uh, for a couple of the sites. One is an opportunity site, the other is some, some commercial retail office opportunities along Route 168. Gateway development, uh, some initial preliminary revisions to the UDO that would need to pl take place in order to support the plan. Um, and then some master plan next steps. Again, just to get everybody oriented to the mega site in and of itself, uh, Virginia, North Carolina state line to the north, bounded by NC 168 to the east, South Mills Road to the south, and a combination of, of undeveloped and residential subdivisions to the west. For the market feasibility, uh, recommendations that came out of that was, you know, create a vision for the mega site uh, through a master planning process, take, taking into account or wanting to ensure some flexibility. Um, it's not necessarily set in stone, but we want to set a course. We want to set a plan to move forward uh, with land uses uh, and densities that will go along with it, and then protect some prime acreage. So when those development opportunities, catalyst sites, opportunity uh, sites come along, there's some prime acreage there for, for future development that hasn't been pushed off or just given, given offered up to the first, first person that shows up for, for development. Diversify the residential product. Uh, you know, there's an opportunity that we talked about from single family housing to townhouse condominiums to potentially even apartments, but diversifying that residential product. Uh, establishing a brand. Uh, we talked about this at planning board and we've talked about it before, you know, sort of branding the site. What do we want it to be? What do we want to attract? But creating a brand for it and then be able to market the site going forward. Uh, and then we look at public participation, you know, what those different levels might be from a policy standpoint, policy incentives from the entitlement process to potential financial incentives uh, where there might be public-private uh, opportunities for, for investment. 
going forward. Uh, and then establishing shovel ready sites based on the master land use plan. Um, and one thing and we've we mentioned it during the the inception of the market feasibility study, during the market feasibility study, and then again kicking off the master plan in and of itself. And it's about patience and persistence. Uh, it's to create that vision, keep keep the momentum going forward, but also patience. As we've talked about before, it's a 25 to 30 year plan. It's not a five year or 10 year plan, but it's but it's long range, it's long vision, it's staying the course uh, and being patient and persistence along patient and persistent along the way. Um, it is a market driven plan. Um, Lori mentioned the, the small area plan, which gave some ideas of some wants, desires, needs within within Moyoc, um, from different types of retail retail uses that were desirable uh, to to some other considerations. If initially there was some not so much residential, but that's part of the plan. And in order to get some of those other uh, retail commercial type services, uh, you need more residential along the way. But the market component allowed us to validate what we thought about Currituck County, Moyoc and how it fit within the Hampton Roads region, uh, from land uses to potential developable acreage, um, so on and so forth. And then the other part component was community-based, reaching out to existing property owners, reaching out to potential developers, uh, stakeholders, input from the county staff, but again, getting input from others uh, as far as what that vision might need to look like beyond what the market could be. And so in the market feasibility study, uh, we came up with developable acreage. Um, approximately 3,300 acres were under consideration when we, when we conducted the market feasibility study. There's a little bit of that breakdown from residential, retail office, uh, medical office, industrial, um, and then maintaining some open space for some other things, your roads, your wetlands, stormwater, land bank, right-of-way utilities, those kinds of things. So sort of this, is, this was that breakdown coming out of the market feasibility study that then would lead into our first steps getting into the master plan component. Um, as a part of the master plan, we can look at the market feasibility study, we see some numbers, but then we have to start looking at the physical components of the site. What's that physical makeup that we have to take into consideration as we start to lay out those different land uses, the roadway network, infrastructure, utilities that are out there, uh, adjacent land use patterns, and what are some constraints we need to take into consideration. Uh, what we also looked at were regional trends and planned projects. Um, you know, some of the things that we're looking at were some other residential development that was already underway that we needed to take into account as a part of the market. Um, we also knew there were some advanced conceptual plans out there with residential development, some potential ideas, thoughts on retail commercial layouts, street network, those kinds of things, and then roadway infrastructure in and of itself. Um, and one of the key things from the roadway infrastructure was taking into consider consideration the east-west connector and how that might fit and serve the mega site, um, sort of also as we consider the potential Moyak bypass uh, and, and how those larger regional projects and how they might fit and would lay out and impact the site to what are just some improvements we would need to make to the existing adjacent infrastructure of South Mills Road, 168, and then starting to get into the internal roadway infrastructure uh, to support the scale of development under consideration. Some key objectives uh, as we were getting into it um, from way back when and meeting with the public, what were we trying to achieve? One is the vision, uh, but some things that we took away and sort of consolidated into essentially six primary things is an employment center, job creation, you know, that tax base, increasing the tax base or grow the tax base within the county. Create, create a place for young people to come back to. One of the things is, you know, folks grow up here, but then they move away. What's, what's an opportunity to keep, keep that, that, that knowledge base here, let people, you know, live and grow up, and then next generation. Uh, destination work play environment. Uh, some references the town center uh, as a part of that live work play, uh, probably not to that scale or density. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about along the way is uh, comparable development would be Harborview in the city of Suffolk. Um, pedestrian friendly and make it feel like a destination uh, at the end of the day. So here's the here's the mega site master plan as it relates to the, the various land uses um, with commercial retail. 
fronting 168. Uh, you go about a level into it, and you're looking at some potential office, medical office, and you'll hear me say those interchangeably. Uh, there's some opportunity there for both. Um, some initial conversations, what looks like some opportunities for some medical office development in and around the site. Um, one level in, and then as you move west from that, some opportunities from townhouse, condominium, and a, and a, a multifamily uh, apartment types. Sort of surrounding that is also, you get into some lower density, your traditional single family uh, residential in and, in and around that. Some potential for some opportunity sites to the south, you know, kind of it has South Mills Road uh, to the very south there, but some office and institutional or office and in industrial opportunity sites for consideration. And then toward the back of the site, looking at more of the, the larger industrial warehouse and where industrial distribution type facilities. Um, again, looking long term, looking long range, how that connection could be uh, and how Currituck fits with the Hampton Road re region. And in this case, how those types of sites and developments could tie to the port. Uh, with Virginia uh, in distribution of facilities. So this is the overarching plan. Um, one thing here, uh, Tom, you see some, yes, sir. Let's get you to pause. Why you have this up, one of the comments made was water retention. As we know, we have issues uh, up there. Uh -huh. And so I just wanted to point out to people, and, and part of that planning process, you've got retention ponds set up around the area. It's, it's obviously been a uh, at the forefront of the development of this and, and the thought yes. process. So, yep. Uh, to anybody out there, it, 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 we've thought long and hard about it, at least you guys have. No, that's, that's a great point. Thanks for the pause. Um, sometimes I just get rolling. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the retention ponds, the stormwater ponds is our, you can see them on the site, but that was a feature. And in fact, you know, that, that goes back to that conversation of, of staff you know, coming in and, and sharing that local knowledge and making sure that we're, we're aware of that and how we might lay that out on the site. You know, things that are being dealt with today and how do we need to anticipate addressing those items going forward. Um, so that's, thank you for, for that pause. And the other part is there's some areas in here that are shown as, as wetlands. And I know that doesn't always resonate well uh, with the landowner and, you know, where, where's my piece in this, in this mega site master plan. And right now it's, it's shown that way in, in a lot of that, that um, demarcation on this map is the result of us using primarily, you know, it's sort of high level. We're looking at the data sources that are readily available. Granted, we, we had some folks walk some sites when we were doing the, the market feasibility study just to confirm some things. Um, but then as it relates to the master plan and some of these air, other parcels that are shown on the plan as wet, that's best basically we've only relied on, you know, the data that's sort of at hand with floodplains, floodways, and or national wetlands inventory. So that's what we know right now. And you'll see as next steps action items to do a formal wetland delineation is one of those action items. Uh, because we understand there, there might be more there than we're actually seeing from the database. Um, and that's where that getting boots on the ground to confirm some things, you know, starts to refine and get more into that engineering to, to say what might be de actually developable at the end of the day. So, as a part of the master planning process, this was the development summary. You saw the, the sort of the summary that came out of the market feasibility study, relatively high level. And then as we got into the mega site master plan and really started to dial in a little bit more on some land uses, where those fit in and around the site, and then what those might be, and the acreages associated with each of those pr proposed land uses. And again, it's sort of a cross check of the, the development summary against the market feasibility study to make sure we're on course uh, with what we we're what we, with what we we're projecting uh, and or allocation of land in and on the site. Uh, one of the other things that, that you know, in addition to the stormwater component that came out of those conversations, uh, was also des designation dedication of open space to relate to greenways, trails, those kinds of kinds of things. Going back to the walkability piece. Um, also, the, de the designation or identification of a potential school site. So as the residential grows, and we had the conversation last week about some of the capacity of the current schools, you know, just recognizing now with, with the growth, we already need to be think thinking about a school site to support this. Um, and maybe there's another one as a part of this development as well. But that was another item that came up in the conversations to identify early. 
Um, talked about one of the enlarged area plans. So this would have been one of the sort of the components that you saw sort of up against 168. This was our mixed-use core um, with 168 bounding it to the, to the east there with the commercial retail sort of fronting that highway corridor, that, that highway commercial. And then as you go sort of a layer, if you will, in the medical office office opportunity to lay out maybe either a larger site or maybe even a small campus type feel as it relates to medical office, some multifamily, and then a different type, if you will, of single family attached, different type product, uh, and then, a, and then a, a small park area toward the back. But just an idea of what the street grid, land uses, compatibility, or how those land uses might lay out amongst once another, one another uh, in an area like this. Uh, here's the master plan of the office in, in, in industrial. Um, there's an emphasis on creating some opportunity sites. Um, and I say that because, you know, there's, there's been some discussions about, you know, potential office and or industrial warehouse type users looking, looking at the mega site, potential opportunities. And with that, what we don't want to do is offer up the first site at the back of the, at the back of the property. So this brought that closer, if you will, to the existing infrastructure, which helps, you know, Get a potential user something on something that they want sooner rather than later. Less of a larger infrastructure investment up front, um, and allows that to to, to be attracted uh, to the development as a part of the as a part of the project. Uh, and with that, some potential redevelopment of some single family along Newtown Road, and then uh, another single family to the west. There is is a result of or reflects some ideas that were of one of those advanced conceptual plans that was already under consideration. Uh, we talked about gateway corridors. Um, and with that, we look at the site and the different layout and the roadway network infrastructure and how the, how the, the site would be served. Um, and so the one up upper left there is a conceptual typical section of what 168 might turn into in the future. Um, there's already been some preliminary discussions. Today you know it is the five-lane five lane typical section, two-way two -way left turn lane running down the middle of it. We've had some discussions with NCDOT already about maybe introducing uh, the idea of a raised median along that corridor. Um, but this reflects sort of a, a, a longer-term opportunity for improvement. Now, in addition to the median, some landscaping, uh, some green space buffers along the edge, as well as a multi-use trail. And then, as we've gone through the master planning piece, starting to designate utility corridors adjacent to these roadway facilities. And then, with the gateway corridors, uh, you start to get a consistent vibe uh, for development. The other is Central Parkway which if you get a chance to go back to the master the master plan for the site, the mega site master plan, the Central Parkway is this sort of north-south roadway. Looks somewhat similar uh, to 168. Obviously, you might have a, a, a slightly lower speed limit along the Central Parkway um, facility, um, but you'd also, also off, offer like a greenway trail on one side, multi-use trail, as well as sidewalks. And, a, and an easement as well. But these, these become sort of your gateways, you're setting the tone, you're setting the vision coming into the development of the expectations and how you're accommodating traffic uh, as well as cyclists, pedestrians uh, along those corridors. So one of the things we also talked about um, and dealt with as part of the development of the master, use, master land use plan or the master plan for the mega site is the unified development ordinance. And so we had folks sort of scan through the existing UDO and one of the things we quickly realized is there really is no zoning district in place to support the vision, the land uses, the potential densities uh, associated with the Moyoc mega site. Um, so as, as you might expect, so with the, the, the current UDO, there needs to be some revisions, you need to be updated, figure out what that rewrite would need to look like as we get into those land uses and densities. Um, that's sort of a identified next step. Um, and imagine Currituck and the future land uses associated with that, that project needs to account for the Moyoc Megasite Master Plan as a part of that. So those land uses already start to get recognized as, as a part of the county's vision. Um, and the UDO revisions, what they're intended to do uh, is, number one, recognize the vision of the Moyoc Megasite Master Plan, uh, sort of set that roadmap, if you will, for development. Uh, not only in Moyoc, but the megasite 
uh, in its entirety going forward. Uh, it needs to be clear, it needs to be predictable, consistent for developers as they come in the door. They have a good understanding of the entitlement process and expectations as it might relate to development uh, or contributions to infrastructure improvements. Um, and then one of the other things is, you know, well, what, what exactly do we do within the UDO? What can we use that's already there? And as we looked at it, there's the plan development mixed use district, and that zoning allows for an area plan uh, to be recognized, sort of independent, if you will, without having to go and touch all the other zoning districts. You can create um, your own design standards, design guidelines, as it relates to the area plan, specifically to the Moyak megasite. Um, so master plan next steps, um, sort of first and foremost, is to adopt the Moyak, the Moyak megasite master plan. The other thing we talked about was incorporating the master plan and the associated land uses into the Imagine Kurtuk future land use plan. Beyond that, it's getting into the UDO. Uh, you know, we spoke with Lori and Ben and Donna about those next steps and updating the code. Um, and as mentioned before, the plan, <clears throat> plan development and mixed use seems to be the right fit uh, to be modified to accommodate uh, the Megasite master plan. Begin to market the plan. One of the things in conversations, and you saw it in the paper, and we've talked about it last week, is, is the mega uh, phrase as a part of the development. In, and in even talking with the, the marketing group is, is coming up with a different name at the, at the end of the day. Uh, to some folks, that makes them nervous. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's let's market the plan, let's figure out what that, that phrase is that's consistent with the vision uh, of the residents as well as the county going forward. Uh, continue to engage and coordinate with property owners, potential developers in the Moyak community. It's So far it's been very transparent, a lot of great outreach. Um, folks have been brought in multiple times to talk about you know, if they're a property owner, what their plans are, their visions, their ideas to, hey, what do you think of this, and us presenting information to them and getting, getting feedback. Um, and again, going back to maintaining that practice, I think it's helpful. I know it was helpful for us. I'm sure it's helpful to the county, and I'm sure it's helpful to you all uh, to hear what the community thinks about uh, the Moyak megasite and that vision. And I will say there's a lot of positive discussions and comments about this idea, this vision, uh, and where it can take the county uh, into the future. Um, Development strategies. Um, so one of the things coming out of the, the more Megasite Master Plan is, is look at some logical phases of development. As I mentioned briefly, with the infrastructure investment, you, we don't want to start at the back. You know, let's look at some realistic, logical phases of development uh, over time. Maintain those catalyst opportunity sites. Again, you know, where do we want to configure those? Carve them out to the side. Uh, conducting the formal wetlands delineation. You know, we know that's one thing we need to get a little more detail on. And then there's a list of other things that really start to lead into the here's the plan now we're starting to get into a lot more of the the details uh, in the engineering component that helps that helps the Moyak megasite master plan become a reality and that's a transportation plan a water distribution uh, master plan stormwater master plan sanitary sewer to figure out you know what are all those infrastructure needs you know to support the plan and again I'll go back to we're taking, taking, taking bite-sized pieces. We're not trying to do it all at once, but it's figuring out what those phases are and what those components, manageable components are to help it move forward. Um, and then with that, as I mentioned, the phasing and the program development, you're part of the next steps is figure out what, what are those costs and how do we start to program those infrastructure improvements going forward uh, steadily and then what are what are some potential alternative funding mechanisms is that the traditional this is you know from from the tax base to are there some public private opportunities out there that can help sustain the development um, and moving it forward but those those are sort of the list of next steps beyond you know the master plan in and of itself the associated land uses uh, and that general layout of land use and roadway network infrastructure Got a, it's on. Thank you. Got a comment and a question. Yes, sir. First of all, my comment regarding to businesses in the county. Um, I grew up here all my life. And when I was in high school graduating, all the discussion was you're going to go work at the Ford plant, you're going to go work at the shipyard, you're going to go work somewhere. There was no discussion of working within the county. That's the way it was and hasn't changed much over the years, if I can tell. 
Um, and one of the questions I was asked before I was a commissioner and still right now as a commissioner is what's the county doing to, to attract businesses in our county um, so we have a place for our, our graduates if they want to stay here and work to work. And what type of investment is the county doing to help attract businesses to our county? Um, yeah, this, and the question I have for you is if a business is looking to relocate or establish a place, how important is it to have something in place, to have a vision, to have a plan to let a business know that, yes, we're thinking about the future, we're thinking about our, our, our growth and our, and our children and our generations to work here, something like this. I mean, what's the value of this to somebody looking in our area? Uh, it's tremendously valuable uh, to external developers, folks that are just um, looking for opportunities because you've done your homework. You can probably present the plan. You have an idea of where that particular use might be situated within a grander scheme of things. The other, the other thing that it does show is that there is a vision, that there's taken time to set a vision for the county and that there's a vision of long-term growth and economic development. And if you're a business trying to take, take advantage or be a part of that economic sustainability within a community, you've set the tone. There's a vision here. We want to be a part of that. So that investment up front to, to establish a plan, to establish a vision, start to understand what you and have a good understanding of what your needs are to support them is tremendous uh, for folks looking at opportunities. The other part of it is, and we, we've sort of joked about it in some discussion, developers, they, they want it relatively easy. They don't want to have to guess at what the, the entitlement process might be. They don't want to guess how long that process might be to have a particular site uh, at the end of the day or what the potential number or infrastructure on that might fall on them as a part of trying to develop in a particular community. So if those sites and the expectations have been set from infrastructure to where the properties are located, what uses are adjacent to those potential uses can be shared up front, it makes it a lot easier to attract businesses uh, than not. Mr. Collins, I have a question. Uh, we had several community meetings, Imagine Currituck and so on. How much did that influence the plan? Um, it, it, it was, I was going to say fortunate or unfortunate, it was, it was separate because, and I, and I say that because we started with the notion of the small area plan. We went into the market feasibility study um, to kind of, again, validate what what were what was the potential for development <clears throat> in Currituck County for particular types of uses, um, and, and didn't per se get influenced by that component as much as Moyak proper and the community in and around Moyak and what those uses could be and what that community really desired at the end of the day. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we did meet with um, or sent out letters to 44 property owners in the area, and we met with um, a significant number of those uh, staff meeting. We did have a community meeting um, last month uh, for this. Um, so we've done significant outreach with, uh, with this project. And that will continue, correct, as we progress? Mm -hmm. Correct. We would, and we created an email distribution list of um, concerned citizens to let them know where we are in this process, and we will continue to keep them updated as well as through our social media, our website, and um, all the other regular forms of communication the county uses. Thank you. So, so, so kind of a collective, collective question, question. Um, Dan, Lori. Um, we have analysis that shows that in the next 20 years, how many dwelling units are going to be needed to be constructed in order to keep up with the projected growth of the county? The number that we've used in, in the long-range plan, the land use plan, the Imagine Curry Tuck that was referenced earlier, um, is about 4,000 units uh, total over the next uh, 25 to 30 years, and that's going to average out to over uh, 200 a year that we're going to need every year, new and, home dwelling units. And those that is based on U.S. Census projected growth data for the county. So that's, that's an external data. And, and is that, is this mega site? Did that have any impact on what that analysis should? Um, in other words, I was under the impression that number is based upon the economy, our 
Kind of you know, the county, the finances of North Carolina, the tax rates, all of that is what helped the census data come up with that. I would say that's correct, and I would say this report is more in planning for that than driving that. And that's, the, that's where I was going with this. So if they don't work here at this mega site, they're working in Chesapeake, in Virginia Beach, in Norfolk, in Portsmouth, in Suffolk, et cetera, et cetera. The point being, we know that folks are coming to the county. They're coming to the county. We can either wait for it to happen or we can try to do what we can do to capture some of the industries and some of the businesses that those people are going to be driving up the road to five days a week, 52 weeks a year, up through Hampton Roads to go off and go to work. So th this is trying to get ahead of the snowball because they're coming. And if we don't do this now, and it takes, this is a long-term plan, yes, it's, yep. again, persistence and patience. Mm -hmm. If we don't start something now, then we're going to be left with what's with the train. And I'm going to go ahead and make a comment. Again, growing up in the county and the school systems, <clears throat> I know that always comes up as a big question. Well. I went to elementary school here. I saw the developments. I saw Moyak develop. I saw the county develop. And one thing I always remembered is I saw the new high school get built when it was needed to be built. I saw Griggs get expanded when the need was there. I've seen the elementary schools get built when the need was there. Uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is living here all my life, when, when the need for a school system rose its head, the county has always built the school system when it was needed. And I've seen that over decades take place. And the planning is taking place now, watching the growth. I'm sure the county, when the, the school board tells the commissioners that, okay, we need another school, the county commissioners are gonna act on it. Um, they're not gonna sit down, they haven't in the past. They've always been great with it. The school systems have, have, have expanded and, and been built when they need to. So I envision this, you know, it's, we got a long-term plan, but as the need develops, the county's going to stay up with the school systems. Um, they always have in the past. I haven't seen it falter. Uh, like I said, I can just speak, speak from living here all my life. We've got land set aside possibly here. We're looking right now for land possibly in the area for, for growth. Um, but, uh, again, I just feel confident the county has always in the past and will in the future be ready when that need is developed or comes, up, comes up to fore. And follow up on that. I believe we had some discussion about that. That the, the census numbers, we had we had a pretty good understanding of when exactly a, the need for a new school is going to come, based on pretty pretty reliable historical statistical data. Is that, is that not correct? That is correct. Uh, yeah. Planning staff tracks every time the board commissioners approves a subdivision. Uh, we use a, a a national formula that we have locally verified to project future growth and how many. Students are coming out of that growth. We've compared that. We have a running comparison to our available capacity of our schools. So we track that um, daily. And based on the current growth projections, based on the approvals that the Board of Commissioners have already done with subdivisions that are on paper that have not started yet necessarily, uh, we are not looking at the need of an elementary or any school uh, until 10 years plus out. But as soon as the school board addresses that need with us, we'll sit down and have that discussion. And if it, is, that, if, it, if it comes uh, to that, yeah. One of the obligations of the board of commissioners to secure and pay for the school site. So one of your duties, yes. If I can, for clarity, Mike Payment grew up in this county. <laughs> and his whole, his whole life? His whole life. And he was in the van. In case someone didn't catch that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, give him a uh, if I could, Mr. Collins, land values. For the next 25, 30 years, we're looking at this site plan. 43 possible owners of the property as we start to build it. How do we keep the values to where the guy that gets the first couple of spots, in other words, towards the front of the road, gets a certain value for his land, the guy towards the middle gets a different value, and the guy towards the back, where one of those doesn't feel like they're slighted, puts a halt to our plan, or somebody doesn't sit there and say, wait a minute, I'm in the middle, and I want the same dollar that the guy at the front gets. How do we keep somebody from stopping 
this quickly and heavily until they get the dollars they want. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, you know, so one of the things we talked about is development agreements. Um, and, and if you can get multiple landowners you know, to either sign on, agree to, collaborative effort as it relates to various components of the mega site so that one doesn't feel slighted. It also goes back to the phasing piece. So there's the Moyoc mega site master plan in and of itself, and then there's also the potential, the development goes in phases, and those landowners begin to understand that it will happen in phases. So the residential, the retail that is up against 168 might go first, and that in and of itself, because it's residential, or excuse me, retail, commercial development up front or office up front, it, it's going to drive its own land value over time when the next next level comes online and comes online because there starts to be some synergy those values of, of land automatically start to increase maybe they're not as valuable as the corner of south mills and 168 in three years but because the development has begun to occur synergy has started to happen around let's call it phase one of the mega site so that phase two is is comparable uh, from a land value over time. that The guy in the back, of course, day one is not going to be as valuable as that piece of property up front. Um, but as they start to understand those phases and, and how development occurs over time, being a part of the overarching Mobiak mega site master plan is better than being on the outside at the end of the day. Let's well, say, for instance, I'm in the middle or towards the back, and I'm waiting for my money 15 years down the road, and they've already got theirs. And another developer comes to me and says, hey, I want to put a something here, commercial, residential, whatever it might be. I decide I want to pull out. Well, these UDO changes and everything we we have, could that prevent me from pulling out and selling my land for much more money? Uh, well, then, but let's just say, does that use match the master plan at the end of the day? And then with that, even if it matches it, then it's how do we get the infrastructure to that particular site, if they're in the middle or to the back of the site? Again, it goes back to that phasing piece and trying to draw the infrastructure that is in place from 168, some of its south mills, to the west. So if they're in the middle or in the back, it's it's one of those, it's a matter of time, a little bit of the waiting game. It goes back to the persistence and patience. Um, if you're at the back, that's part of the, the patience piece. Um, and again, understanding if you have that piece and you're trying to sell it, are you also going to try and negotiate how you're going to bring infrastructure uh, to that piece of property when and if you're able to sell it to that, that developer at the end of the day. That's the missing component is the infrastructure likely won't be there for that particular landowner at that time if they're trying to sell it sooner rather than later. And that becomes a big component of the value of the land in, in lieu of proximity to the infrastructure or proximity to the infrastructure that's already in place. That brings me to my next question. We're looking at the east-west connector in the center there that's driven by as we do in phases. I've heard conversation now about South Mills Road. And one of my concerns is that's probably one of the most dangerous roads we have in Currituck. And in that, I know that there are talk about rerouting, changing, fixing. Before we start having commercial vehicles using South Mills any more than it is, I mean, how far along, I mean, before... I, I was under the impression originally we were going to try and force all of the commercial, all of the type things using the connector, not using South Mills Road for the construction phase of it. And my concern is I'm putting these big trucks on there to a road system. How far down the road before South Mills gets fixed, before we allow commercial vehicles on there to take and do construction or to feed what we build? So if, if you're looking at the back of the site, sort of that larger sort of areas of property, that industrial warehouse uh, in the east-west um, connector, that is the further down the road, the, the 15 to 20 years out with the east-west connector and some of that industrial, that's the larger scale industrial warehouse piece. Um, so we met with NCDOT, I think it was November of last year, um, and so they actually have a project, project underway um, with design, 
uh, that's looking at improving the width of the travel lanes that are on South Mills Road, the shoulders, and in some cases, um, relocating or shifting the ditch along South Mills Road. The other thing that they shared is that one of the curves along the way here, um, let's say it is the curve kind of almost to the immediate south of where that pond is, where there's a pro where five, five parcels that are undeveloped, un untouched, um, but right kind of southwest, if you will, of the school site. But there's a curve there today that they have indicated that they're going to flatten as a part of those improvements. So that design, if you will, for South Mills Road to make some safety enhancements to the existing facility is already underway. Um, and it was very encouraging because as a part of that conversation, what they also asked was, tell us a little bit more about the Moyak Megasite Master Plan. Tell us a little about the un uses. What are the potential trip generation that you're talking about? Uh, as a part of the development. And from that, we shared traffic volume projections. We also gave them some ideas, thoughts on intersection improvements up at South Mills and 168 from adding some additional exclusive turn lanes to entertaining the idea of signalization uh, at South Mills as a part of those preliminary improvements. Now, the bigger, larger scale, if the east-west uh, connector doesn't come online and do you look at South Mills Road as a four-lane divided that's one of those ones that, again, it would match up, if you will, from a timeline of east-west connector, probably being 15 to 20 years out at the end of the day. But preliminarily, if, if we're talking about the office in, in, in industrial, kind of right there along Newtown Road, there's that first segment that is enough to accommodate the volume of traffic uh, that would be associated with that site. And again, between the safety improvements that they mentioned for South Mills Road to even the intersection improvements would be would, would be enough to accommodate that level of development as a part of the plan. Have they given you a time frame or is it where it may be? Um, I, I don't recall off the top of my head as far as where they were with design, but if you want, I can follow up with the folks with NCDOT and send that back to Dan or Lori and get you an answer on timeline. Please. Okay. Dan. Just, at our last RPO meeting, they in fact addressed South Mills and the planning for making it safer and, 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 and taking care of some of the projects, if I remember correctly, didn't yeah, they? There, there's, there's an effort underway with DOT right now right. to do that. Right. right. Careful, 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 and they're well aware of that connector as as a uh, venue or as an access point to this. So that they're they're well engaged. And as we've learned on so many other issues, until there's the trip counters, nothing happens in DOT. And I, I think we'll get them. For most of our RPO projects are three to five years, roughly. Well, the bridge is oh. going on. For, for what? <laughs> Other than the bridge. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, probably three to five years, I would say. Okay. And last but not least, Mr. Collins, and I'll turn it over to somebody else if there's any more. <laughs> the plan that we have here, this is still conceptual. This can change continually. Or is this still we starting to lock in now? There is the opportunity for change. So the one thing is, to your point, it's not set in stone by any means. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we want it to be flexible, but we also need to set a vision. We need to set some constraints to it, but it's not set in stone. So if there's, like I said, the, med the, the office medical office is somewhat interchangeable. If, if a bigger medical office piece wanted to show up and set up a campus in, in place of just general office, that's great. That's the kind of flexibility you're looking for. The retail commercial components, absolutely. Um, but what we don't want to do, back to Mr. Payment's statement, we don't just want to not know what we're doing. We're, this kind of gives a good vision of intent. Acreages, densities, that'll get refined. Where some things line up uh, adjacent to one another might get tweaked a little bit, but this is intended to set sort of the vision, the tone, but there is flexibility uh, in the plan at the end of the day. Have you met with the people that spent 16, 18 months on the small Moyak small area plan as a group to see if this is what their vision was? Um, some of those folks participated in, in the various public information meetings I attended, was involved with stakeholder meetings, and I know Lori's probably had more follow-up subsequent meetings than myself, but 
from some of the folks that participated in that and have seen this or been a part of either market feasibility presentations or the preliminary master plan, most of the comments have been very positive about what this is and what it's evolving into. And the small area plan talked a lot about employment and we address the employment piece. We address you know, the retail piece and the, the needs of some certain services with, with, with that. The, probably the one thing, but I think people have gotten over it through the conversations, and I say over it, um, was, <laughs> was the, initially there were some, you know, we don't want more residential, but reality is um, to attract some of the additional retail uh, and or commercial services into the area, you need more rooftops um, to attract the additional services that go along with it. Um, and so, Lori, I'd say if there were any other things from folks that participate in the small area plan, I don't know if you've heard from subsequent public meetings. Um, we've been keeping in contact with those people. Uh, they're on our email distribution list. Uh, so if they've had any comments, they've had just as much opportunity, if not more, um, than everyone else to comment on that. Um, we've been hearing issues, uh, traffic, uh, worry about schools, um, and the fact that this is going to look different than a lot of stuff that's, all, that's in Currituck, but it's, it's supposed to look different. Um, and another concern that we heard at the, uh, one of the community meetings is um, a lot of people think that the county is going to come in and, and build all of this stuff. This is not. This is a plan in place so that developers would be attracted to come here because we're going to grow, and this is a, is a document to help us manage that growth and make it um, leverage that to what we want, which is an employment center and maybe some medical things in here and retail opportunities for the county. Thank you. And to clarify, you said that the residential piece would come, and that I'm imagining to be part of the later phases. Would that would that be? It could be, and I, and I say it could be because it's when we spoke um, last week, and we've heard and seen before that there's already subdivisions uh, that are in the process, if you will, of either being approved, about to be approved. So there's there's already some residential development on the books. Uh, but it's not to say we haven't heard some interest from other uh, residential developers about the site and what and, and what the opportunities might be as it relates to this plan and where they might be located on the site. I mean, I've, so one of the areas with the very large pond in the middle is and the, the low density residential that's around it is from one of those earlier conceptual plans that was brought to our attention. Um, so that's out there. As far as when it will happen, don't know. We have, again, we have to see what that market looks like. The other part is uh, that we touched on is the UDO needs to be updated to accommodate you know, some of the residential products that we're talking about at the end of the day. In fact, I would say it needs to be updated to accommodate any of the land use or um, residential products that we're talking about at the end of the day. It's, it is, as Lori mentioned and we've shared before, it's, it, it's not intended to look like everything that's out here or has occurred you know, previously, it's going to look slightly different and that UDO needs to be updated to accommodate uh, that development pattern and those particular residential products. And in your conversations with um, potential commercial developers, um, ha have you had some interest and in, in really um, some folks that you would consider as, as ready to sign on? If if we started moving forward? I, I think there are some folks that are very interested in, in, in signing on uh, from a residential, or excuse me, from a commercial piece. Um, we, we've met with some folks about, um, that's with county staff, um, about the medical office opportunity. So there's definitely an interest there of, of new medical mm -hmm. office in and around here. The one thing with the commercial, re commercial slash retail component, um, they want to sign on, and that's that's great. But there's some things we still want to make sure are in place, so that the sign on early isn't, you know, kind of the pattern of development and in, in, in pattern of development more so than anything that's sort of out there today. Um, nothing against what's out there today, but this is going to be different. Um, and so, and if we're trying to be consistent with that, and and you'll see with some other things, what we want that corridor to look like, what we want some of those development standards, design design guidelines to look like for, for storefronts along that corridor. Um, again, it goes back to that patience piece. Um, 
we're, we're happy that they're interested, but there needs to be a patience component because there is a vision and the, the tools need to be in place to accommodate the development that supports the vision of the master plan at the end of the day. Okay, and one last question um, to clarify for the public. I continuously get phone calls about the mega site um, because the potential of, of breaking ground within a year, um, it, it's, it's a long-term plan. And once this plan is adopted, it's going to take, in, in a timeline, would you say, three to five years before we really start breaking ground, or do you think it would be sooner? I think there could be breaking ground on some smaller sites um, sooner than three to five years. Okay. So we've, and I'll share some of the conversations that we had with just updating the UDO in and of itself is probably somewhere in the range of nine to 12 months. So that has to be in place. And then it's the entitlement process uh, with developers that are interested and have followed the pattern and now they're ready to adjust to, adapt to, and understand uh, those those standards as it relates to the U UDO. So that's why I say it could be two to three years for the folks that are already interested. They've been, they've been watching the ticker, uh, if you will, as far as when things might become available. Um, so it could be two to three years for that first breaking of ground as it relates to the master plan. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Mr. Collins? Thank you, Mr. Collins. Right, thanks. And with that, I'll open the public hearing. I currently have uh, Jennifer Knight and Michael Carter signed up for public hearing. Uh, you spoke during public comments. Would you like to speak again? Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I was just um, wondering, and I don't know if I can have a question answered at this time, but as I was listening to this gentleman speak, I kept hearing him saying, you know, folks have done surveys, folks have done surveys regarding wetlands, but it's my understanding, and perhaps I'm mistaken, but it's my understanding that those have to be conducted by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so I was just wondering about that. I don't know if you can answer that right now. but Wetlands are required, and they are part of the... the the next step that we have to do, but a wetland delineation will be done, will be signed off the Army Corps, and that's part of the process. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's all I have signed up for public hearing. Does anyone else want to come up and speak? Ms. Hall. Can you please state your name and address for the record? My name is... My name is Denise Hall. I live at 174 Old Jury Road in Moyoc. <laughs> and I have more of a question. When Chesapeake developed Red Knot, the apartment complex in Edinburgh, did they contact us to, for input or require any consultation with us? And that would be a question for either you, Mr. Scanlon, or probably Ben Woody. Uh, there was no contact with us about either project. Amen. So we don't normally work with Virginia on projects in North Carolina. What, what, uh, I wouldn't say that we don't work with each other. The planning staff occasionally get together. We work with the RPO up in Hampton Roads area, but the Edinburgh development was not brought down here for public input, public comment. They didn't talk to our staff about what we thought to, to but those projects, they did not solicit specific information. Well, and I can see, right, and I can see why they wouldn't because our residents all go there to spend our money. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's just an observation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Would anyone else like to speak for public hearing? With that, I'll close the public hearing, and I'll open the floor for a motion to adopt the Mayock Megasite Master Plan. I'll, I'll make a motion that we... Um, we adopt the uh, Megasite Master Plan and, and move forward with the next steps. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to old business. Consideration of resolution and order closing old U.S. Highway 158, also known as Secondary Road, 1405 and Old Ferry Landing, Coin Jock, Poplar Branch Township. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. McCree. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. McCree, if we can, let the folks clear out. I'm sorry. Thank you. If yes, you Mr. Chairman, when this matter last came before the board uh, with the consent of the applicant for the closure of old U.S. Highway 158 and an adjacent property owner, 
the board continued the matter uh, to this as a date and time certain to, to consider it. Uh, since that meeting, we have received communications from both those parties again who have asked that this matter be continued off of this agenda uh, to be placed again onto an agenda if necessary as uh, the property owners, the Stony Ciphers, are, are working with State De uh, Department of Transportation uh, and a surveyor to determine whether they indeed may have uh, title to the underlying roadbed of old U.S. Highway 158 due to some agreement and some conveyance that may have been made to the state back when that road was first constructed. The adjacent property owner who's the applicant for this matter has no problem with continuing the matter to let that issue be resolved. Their main concern, I think, was trying to resolve the ownership issues with regard to that old roadbed so that they can maybe move forward with, uh, with the possibility of acquiring the property for a future project. So with that, I would ask for the board's uh, uh, consent to continue this matter from this agenda. Okay, Mr. I'm sorry. Sorry. We would continue this until they bring it back to us? Yes. Okay. So do, would I make a motion then just to remove this off the off our business agenda until they're ready to bring it back? Yes, that would be appropriate. And we, and we place it on the agenda again because the board directed that it be returned okay. to the agenda as opposed to just <clears throat> not including well, it. Then I'd like to make a motion that we remove this, um, this order of business, uh, this, this item off of our, um, uh, I guess, our businesses until they're ready to bring it back before us and get it back on the agenda. Yeah, Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to PB 13-12, Mayock Commons Phase 1, Order of Entry. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Cicero. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before you, uh, in your agenda packet, um, you have an order for um, uh, Mayock Commons, PB 13-12. The board heard this at public hearing uh, in the June, the earlier June meeting and also in March. You directed staff to create an order um, of approval for Moyot Commons, which is a 55 lot sub residential subdivision um, located in the westerly terminus of Moyot Commons Drive. If that's in your staff, I mean, it's in your agenda packet. If you have any questions about this order, please ask. I guess my, my question is, is there somebody here from the, the group from Moyot Commons? No. Then going over to, on page 72, uh, section B, where it talks about the 400 foot of, uh, <coughs> I guess, second one down, uh, 25 foot uh, wide area combined to create an approximate 400 linear foot wide conservation area buffer. Where exactly are we talking about that on the picture? I guess is my question. I'm just trying to think, was that in the original wording that wasn't there? I'm looking on page 86, I guess. I'm trying to figure exactly where. Is that the area all the way at the top of the screen, I guess? It's a color photo on page 86. Page 86. I'm just trying to make sure I know where that 400 foot is. is I, it I believe it's against the um, Moyox proper, Moyox, the, the, the E Street, B Street, the, the, the village of okay. Moyox. That, that's okay. the area that this is buffer is, is referencing. All right. All right, thank you. And then on page 75, it talks about the road work prior. I know we discussed that. Is that saying that the road has to be improved before they can start construction? Yes, the road would need to be improved to um, NCDOT uh, design and construction standards before any construction can begin in the, in the uh, subdivision area. Thank you. Is that moving dirt or just construction? That's before they are given any, um, the wetlands would need to be, um, would have to uh, issue with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers nationwide permit would have to be um, resolved as well as the uh, NCDOT um, 
design and construction standards would need to be met prior to anything being issued for them. Okay. So with that being said, um, they can't move dirt until that's issued, correct? Correct. Lori, I've got one quick question just to clarify a comment I had asked last time on page 72 at the bottom where it um, states that the Moac Commons proposed egress ingress is via extension of extension Moac Common Drive. A roadway connection to E Street will not be permitted, so they'll not be able to use that for construction or anything, though, correct? Correct. Okay. Any further questions? Uh, I have a question, Mr. McCree. Um, has the applicant met all requirements um, for this to be brought forward and, and voted on? I believe, as I recall, the, the evidence presented to the board during the course of the two hearings was that the applicant had met all the conditions and requirements of the UDO for issuance of a use permit. So for that reason, we're, we are compelled to approve this? Yes, you, you, you are sitting in a quasi-judicial capacity as a court which is much different than your legislative capacity when you consider zoning map amendments and zoning text amendments. In those instances, you may consider anything that's presented to you and may make your decision based upon any consideration that you might have in, in the course of that decision-making process. Sitting as a quasi-judicial body or a court, you are limited to making your decision based upon the evidence presented during the course of the hearing that's held before you uh, and comparing that evidence to the requirements of the ordinance. Um, as, as we've spoken about before, you can only consider what these, these, the case law and the statutes say is competent, substantive, and material evidence. That basically means you can only consider the same type of evidence that a judge could consider in a courtroom in, in the course of a trial. Uh, you also are, are, are not able to consider uh, general, what, what, what our, the law says is generalized speculation or fears about, um, you know, we, we think that this project, if approved, might cause X, Y, or Z. You, you're not permitted to consider that kind of spec speculation or generalized fear. You also are not able to take into consideration any lay or non-expert testimony as it relates to the impact that a project might have on the value of adjacent property or on safety issues, particularly with regard to transportation. You would only be able to consider the testimony uh, of, of experts uh, with regard to those areas uh, of evidence. Um, as I recall, there was no evidence presented uh, by the opponents uh, to this project uh, through experts uh, that in some way defeated the evidence uh, on behalf of the applicant relative to those issues. An example would be the, the stormwater issue, which was a large part of this, uh, the concern expressed by the community and also something looked closely at by the county's engineer and by the applicant's engineers. But as you heard, the testimony that you heard that is competent and that you could actually consider was that and this particular project meets all of our stormwater requirements in that, among other things, it will retain all stormwater on site uh, to be released slowly into the adjacent and off-site drainage systems. And so that, for example, is a type of thing that you would have to accept as competent material evidence. You could not accept uh, concerns expressed by adjacent property owners that they, they believe that this property, this project, if built, might flood them. The bottom line is that uh, in North Carolina, our law is such that if an applicant meets all the requirements of an ordinance, and presents evidence showing that the applicant meets all the requirements of an ordinance, then as a matter of right, uh, they, they are due issuance of a permit, and a board uh, may not, therefore, unlawfully withhold the issuance of that permit. Thank you, Mr. McCree. Any further questions or discussion? With that, I'll open the floor for a motion. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I have one other question on the, um, and Lori, you may be able to answer this, the NCDOT design and construction, um, does it have to meet or be accepted? We've got both of those clauses in the um, 
statement, and I've I've been on record about the the concerns that I have about the safety and the entrance of this development. And I just, without good faith effort, I want to ensure that that is taken care of. So I want to make sure that the verbiage that we have in this um, and the findings and conditions are as stringent as possible. And, and I'm just going to go on record saying that because that has been time and time again a huge concern for me. <clears throat> it is. Um, it would have to meet the standards and con um, DOT standards prior to it being accepted unless for some reason DOT wants to take it as is, which would be completely unheard of. <laughs> so, um, you know, if they came in and said that, then it would be a DOT, and it would be up to DOT to raise it to their standards. But that has not happened. Um, so they, they would, it would be up to the applicant to work with the other property owners of that road to bring that up to DOT standards so that when appropriate, the DOT would be able to take it over. So... Okay, so with that being said, Mr. Um, Mr. Gibble, the, the, I think if you go back to the order, it says or. I want to say and. So, well, or. So it it has to be designed and meet NCDOT standard, or be accepted by NCDOT. Not knowing what the applicant's intention is, it is possible that it can meet the standard, but the request is not made for it to be entered into the DOT maintenance system, or DOT may not accept it in the DOT maintenance system. And so that piece of it is a is a separate. It's because it's or not and. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. And um, also under item four, the use permit shall automatically expire at the middle of the completed application for approval for of a final plat is received, not plant. Is that correct? Should be plat. Should be plat. Okay. Correct. Floor still up before a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion. We accept PB 1312 Mayock's Common Phase 1 order of entry. I get a second? I will second it. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. We have one opposed. Motion passes. Moving on to new business, board appointments. Uh, this is broken down in sections. Uh, so if we can, we'll uh, do nominations per section and then uh, vote on it per section. That's all right with everybody. Uh, the first one is Animal Services and Control Advisory Board. Uh, these are two consensus appointments. Nancy Van Cleef and Laura Hill are both due for reappointment. I would move to do so. You moved. She seconded. Okay. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. The next one is Board of Adjustment. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to nominate Troy Breathwaite of Mayock to fill the unexpired term of Vivian Simpson, and he'll move to serve as an alternate. I'll second that motion. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have one administrative comment. <clears throat> he just got appointed to the board. Oh, I'll change that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's some dates on our package that are incorrect. <coughs> I'll adjust that one. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, pay motion passes unanimously. Fire Advisory Board, this is a consensus appointment as well. Chief Melton and Brooks Hart are due for reappointment, and Robert Prevere would be replacing Kevin Morgan. Motion for approval or acceptance. I'll second it. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Game Commission? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to appoint James C. Kaysen, Jr. from Knox Island. He'll replace uh, James Gard, who served his two terms. And, Mr. Chairman, I would like to reappoint Richard Bell. 
and Mr. Chairman, I had uh, wanted to nominate Rod Rom, Rob Rom, I'm sorry, uh, to fill uh, Lewis Davis or Louis Davis's end of his term. Okay. Make a motion to approve them. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Library Board of Trustees. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to reappoint Stacey Vasquez. Mr. Chair, I'd like to um, reappoint Colleen Umplett. And I would like to appoint Rose Kelly. Uh, she's motion for approval. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Recreation Advisory Board. I would move to recommend Liz Turner. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to the consent agenda. Motion for approval. I second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to commissioner's report, Mr. Beaumont. Nothing this week. Sorry, Ms. Etheridge. Nothing. Mr. Hall. Nothing at this time. Mr. White. Uh, got a little bit of something. Uh, All right. Mr. Hall and I, uh, and actually, uh, Denise went over to the Ruritan Club uh, last week, or week before last, last weekend? Last weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it was it was a good time. So we want to just just thank them for inviting us and letting us come over. Um, they had three youngsters that they uh, gave some money to for college to help them out. So it's uh, it's great to see that we have communities organizations like that that are that are still around doing stuff for our youth. And to remind everybody that uh, we've got the uh, Knott's Island Peach Festival coming up, and uh, myself and uh, Mr. Hall, I think you're still in. Uh, yes. Foolishly said we'd jump in the dunk tank too because we couldn't be outdone by you. Well done. So, what time is so uh, we, uh, we haven't we haven't actually committed to a time yet. So, uh, so I, I pitched in high school, right, right. so I'm going to pack tomorrow. So, uh, get that ready. so uh, if you want to dunk a commissioner, please come out to uh, Knott's Island and uh, and get us in the tank if you can. Thank you, Mr. White. Miss Gilbert. A um, couple things um, on. I'm on the Albemarle Commission, and part of that is the NC Works, and they are constantly looking for um, applicants and job seekers, uh, businesses that are looking for employees. So please contact ncworks.gov. Um, if, if you're looking for employment, there's opportunities there. And the other thing is, is um, we all received the Currituck County Senior Center's newsletter, and something that really um, just struck out to me is the red bags that are available at the Senior Center. And what this is is, is you can put all of your medications, prescriptions, daily over-the-counter meds in this bag, keep a list in that bag, um, except for those that need to be refrigerated, and have those visible. So if the EMS or the... Um, if you have to go to the doctors, they are trained to look for these red bags so that they know what kind of medications that you're taking and things like that. So that that's just something I think is very important as our seniors and as all of us age. Um, just something to keep in mind that if you are taking medications, to keep them a list handy and ready so that if an, an emergency situation, it's visible for the um persons that would come to uh, to rescue you <laughs> for for lack of words but i just i just thought that that was something that was really important to bring to light and that they are available at the different county um senior centers and then also um july 4th is coming up we will not have a meeting so i want to wish everybody um a very happy and safe independence day because that's what this country is all about is is our independence Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. Mr. Payment? A couple things. Just want to, um, again, reiterate regarding the fire departments. If you're interested in getting involved, they do the training 
Um, they are looking for support. Um, and, and anything, the, the county's growing. There's a lot of, of different things you can get involved with in the county. I just encourage you, if you have the time, get involved. There, there's so much that this county has to offer. They're always looking for volunteers. Um, if you have the time, that would be wonderful. Um, and also, I, I do believe the, the long-awaited time frame for the, um, the water park is probably going to be opening up this week. Is that not correct? Um, Mr. Scanlon, is that the story as we hear it right now? We, we are working with them to establish us. Uh, okay. Date, yes. Okay. So that's coming to an end. So I keep asking questions when it's going to when it's going to open. Well, it's scheduled for this week, but I guess we'll wait and see again. So, um, but that that's all I have to say. The word of the day would be soon. Soon. <laughs> so, so Mr. Payman, are you, are you and uh, Mr. White, Commissioner White, going to be the first ones to to venture down the slides? The big going to test the them out. Slide, that's okay. Right. I'm definitely letting him go first, though, because I want to make sure that you don't shoot off the top of that thing. Gravity and energy. And the water and Mass. <coughs> problem, so. Mass. <laughs> I'm sure he has an algorithm for that somewhere. Uh, if you can write. Yeah. I have nothing this evening. Okay, enough engineer, James. <laughs> County <laughs> Manager's report. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Current candidates, the planning staff is working with NCDOT on a, a joint project to develop a pedestrian plan for the county as a whole. Uh, and last week they had a series of public meetings throughout the county. Uh, they've also put a survey and a questionnaire online. Uh, so if anybody was unable to attend any of those public meetings, we certainly want their input. And so if they go to connectcurtuck.com, uh, they can go ahead and enter in the, or answer the survey questions. Uh, the surveys are also available at our senior center and our libraries. So we're always looking for public input. And so if anybody has an interest in commenting on a countywide pedestrian plan, we encourage them to uh, go to the locations. And that is it. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. And with that, I will recess the Board of Commissioner meeting and convene the Travel Tourism Authority special meeting. Yes, sir, um, Mr. Chairman, you have a budget amendment for the TDA for spending OCTI tax. Uh, unfortunately, we had an air conditioning unit that went out at the Whalehead Club, and we're asking for funds to go ahead and replace that unit. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Mr. Scanlon? Yeah. After a week like this, I'm all for it. <laughs> uh, what, <laughs> motion for approval. Motion for approval with a second from Mr. Payment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. With that, I will close the special meeting of the Tourism Development Authority, reconvene the meeting of the Board of Commissioners, and enter into closed session pursuant to GS 143-318-11A3 to consult with the county attorney in order to preserve the county client privilege and to receive advice from the county attorney regarding a claim against the county and for the following pending lawsuit, Latendra versus Curtuck County. So moved. Second. Aye. Aye. Aye.